Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Robert Cornegie, Jr., Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and I'm joined today by Councilmember Borelli, Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I'd like to thank Chair Borelli and other committee members for joining this hearing on the implementation of automatic sprinkler requirements in commercial buildings as required by Local Law 26 for year 2004. Following the devastation of the September 11 attacks, the Department of Buildings conveyed, convened the World Trade Center Building Code Task Force. Task Force membership included a diverse array of stakeholders from the city, state, and federal governments, the real estate industry, family members of September 11 victims, and design professionals. The purpose of this task force was to identify ways to improve New York City building safety. The task force eventually issued 21 recommendations, including requiring more robust evacuation plans, illuminated egress path markings, enhanced fire department communications, and stronger design standards. The task force also recommended that all high-rise commercial buildings over 100 feet be retrofitted with automatic sprinkler systems within 15 years, which, among other recommendations, was incorporated into Local Law 26 for the year 2004. We're here today to discuss the compliance with the automatic sprinkler system requirement. Under Local Law 26, buildings were required to have automatic sprinkler systems installed by July 1, 2019. Local Law 26 also required that building owners submit periodic status reports on, in 2011 and in 2018. In the 15-year period following the enactment of Local Law 26, compliance has been minimal. There are 1,232 buildings covered by Local Law 26, and as of May of this year, and mere months before the compliance deadline, only 71 had sprinklers. Even more disturbing, of the 1,232 covered buildings, only 262 submitted the interim status reports required under this law. Today, we're here to discuss why compliance with the automatic sprinkler requirement of Local Law 26 has been lacking, how DOB has tried to promote compliance, and how the safety of workers is exist in existing office buildings can be protected. Uh, I'd like to thank Council Member Lewis for joining us today, and I'd like to pass it on to hear from my co-chair, Chair Borelli. Thank you, Council Member Cornegie. <clears throat> I'm Councilmember Joseph Borelli, and I'm Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, and I want to thank the Chair for holding this hearing today and those members of the public in attendance. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the Fire and Emergency Management Committee members who are present, of which there are none because they sleep late, apparently. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we're here to discuss the City's implementation of automatic sprinkler requirements in commercial building. As Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, I'm interested in learning more how DOB and FDNY coordinate on the issue of automatic sprinkler systems. Uh, the efficacy of automatic sprinkler systems is largely dependent on the proper installation and maintenance of such systems, which include the standards for installation, testing, maintenance, automatic, uh, maintenance of automatic systems. The committees are also interested in examining how the FD's Bureau of Fire Prevention supervises and conducts the many required tests of assist sprinkler systems. Uh, we look forward to the testimony, and uh, we also expect to hear testimony on issues that property owners have uh, encountered in complying with Local Law 26, and we certainly uh, welcome uh, those folks to testify as well. Uh, and I'd like to turn the floor back over to Chair Cornegie and note that we've been joined by Council Member Barry Gredegic. Actually, Barry from the Great Borough of Queens is in the building. Um, <laughs> I'd like, to I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify today to please fill out a card with the sergeant. We'll be sticking to a two-minute clock for public testimony. Um, and I um, raise your hand, your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Yes. Good morning, Chair Cornegie, Chair Borelli, and members of the Committees on Housing and Buildings and Fire and Emergency Management. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm joined today by Gus Sarakis, my first Deputy Commissioner, and Joseph Jardin, Chief of the New York City Fire Department's Bureau of Fire Prevention. We're pleased to be here today to discuss the important issue of sprinkler systems in high-rise office buildings. The benefits of sprinkler systems are well known. They provide a heightened level of fire protection for building occupants. New York City, through the New York City Construction Codes, 
has a long history of requiring sprinkler systems in high-rise buildings. Local Law 5 of 1973 required existing office buildings 100 feet or more in height to install a sprinkler system or to protect areas without sprinkler systems with fire-rated separations. Further, Local Law 16 of 1984 required new office buildings 75 feet or more in height to install sprinkler systems. Local Law 26 of 2004, which I'll discuss in further detail momentarily, was intended to close the gap by requiring all existing office buildings 100 feet or more in height to install sprinkler systems. The department established, as you noted, Chair, the World Trade Center Building Code Task Force following the tragic September 11, 2001 terrorist attack and collapse of the World Trade Center. The task force was primarily established to ensure that requirements, standards, and practices in the design and construction of buildings provide safety for occupants of high-rise buildings. The task force was composed of an executive committee, which included representation from the department, the New York City Fire Department, as well as labor design and real estate organizations. Additionally, the task force was composed of five working groups, structural strength, emergency evacuation, fire protection, mechanical systems, and department operations. The task force issued 21 recommendations in 2003, one of which was requiring existing office buildings 100 feet or more in height without sprinkler systems to install such systems throughout the building within 15 years. This recommendation later became Local Law 26, which also required that compliance reports in years one, seven, and 14 be filed with the department to demonstrate progress with the installation of sprinkler systems. Installation was required to be completed by July 1, 2019. Since the enactment of Local Law 26, the department has been primarily focused on providing education and outreach to building owners. To date, the department has done the following. Created a dedicated FAQ available on our website to provide guidance to building owners. Created a dedicated portal where questions regarding the law could be posed by, by building owners. Issued a building bulletin in July 2011 to clarify which buildings were exempt from the law's requirements issued a building bulletin in December 2017 that provided additional background on the law and its applicability, as well as information regarding requesting an extension from the department for additional time to comply with the law. Mailed a letter to building owners in early 2018, which informed them of the 14-year compliance report, which would be due come July of that year. Issued a service notice in June of 2018, which informed building owners that the 14-year compliance report was due and reminded them about the opportunities to apply for an extension. Issued a service notice in June of 2019 advising owners that the final certifications would be due in July of that year. And finally, mailed a letter to building owners in June of 2019 advising them of such information. Now, Local Law 26 applies to 1,308 office buildings, primarily located in Manhattan. To date, 368 buildings have certified compliance with Local Law 26, which means that they have installed a sprinkler system in their building or demonstrated that they were already in compliance. Building owners were afforded the opportunity to apply to the department for additional time to comply with Local Law 26, and a few building owners have come forward to apply for such an extension. The department received 112 extension applications, of which 22 were approved. Over the coming months, the department will be focused on bringing the remaining buildings into compliance with this requirement by performing heightened engagement with building owners and by taking enforcement actions. The focus is on bringing building owners into compliance and for those owners who do not demonstrate that they are taking steps to comply with Local Law 26, violations will be issued and penalties will be levied. After reviewing the final certifications that came in by the July 1, 2019 compliance deadline, the department issued 1,088 violations in September of 2019 to building owners who were not in compliance. These violations were DOB violations, which were not accompanied by a monetary penalty, but do include an order to correct the condition for which the violations are issued. 
On December 1, 2019, the department will issue oath summonses to building owners who are not in compliance with Local Law 26. The monetary penalties associated with these violations can be waived if building owners certify that they are in compliance with Local Law 26 within 60 days of the violations being issued. Further enforcement actions will include issuing oath summonses with heightened penalties, which are not subject to waiver, to building owners who are not in compliance with Local Law 26. Additionally, the department will conduct an inspection every 60 days to determine whether there had been compliance with the in compliance, and these inspections could result in additional enforcement actions being taken by the department. I want to thank you for your longstanding commitment to this issue, and we certainly look forward to updating both committees on a regular basis as we work to ensure compliance is achieved with Local Law 26. And I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And I do now, as always, appreciate the brevity in your testimony. Um, I don't know if I got the answer to this. You, you, you cited a, a great degree of numbers in terms of compliance, but as of today, how many buildings in New York City have automatic sprinkler systems? I didn't, I didn't want to do the math, sorry. For, and, I, and I don't have the exact number, but I can say this, for the last 35 years, <coughs> this city has required office buildings greater than 75 feet in height to have sprinkler systems. So I certainly will be able to follow up with an exact number. Uh, I just want to also note for the record, we've been joined by Council Member Perkins from the great, great village of Harlem. Can you provide us with a breakdown? Well, obviously you can't, but I'd, I'd also like a breakdown on how many of these buildings are commercial spaces, multifamily, hotels, and manufacturing. That's important for me in the Housing and Buildings Committee to know uh, so that we could uh, do a more targeted look at you know, who, who's compliant and who's not compliant, and if there's an industry standard in some degrees. Sure. Um, and, and now with the problems that we're having around uh, landlords, how, uh, warehousing spaces for um, Airbnb and those types of things. I Certainly. think it's important to know who's in compliance to avert a potential disaster in the future. Certainly, and we will provide all of that information to the council. I do also just want to note that in addition to the uh, local law that I mentioned in my testimony of 1984, through our code development process, which is an inclusive process including owners, industry represent uh, representatives, as well as manufacturers and um, contractors, um, in addition to the design uh, uh, representatives as well, and our city agencies, we do periodically go through a very lengthy process to ensure that our building codes continue to remain at the forefront of design and construction in the city. So certainly we will follow up with you on that information. Uh, thank you. So just uh, the before I go to my co-chair, uh, the last question I have in this round is, uh, can DOB walk us through what the permit requirements would be to install an automatic sprinkler system? It depends on what work is being done as well. So in cases where uh, the individual owner may also be doing uh, gut renovation in addition to the sprinklers, the sprinklers would be a component of that. If it were just a standalone sprinkler application, they would file it as such. So I do want to also just mention here, um, with respect to this population of buildings, the 1,308 buildings that were um, affected by Local Law 26, this entity has been, uh, this department has ensured that our staff resources have been made available um, to the targeted population to ensure that whether it be a simple question of how to come into compliance, as you've asked, Council Member, on the, on the technical permitting, or if it is a more in-depth question in order to ensure that an owner can actually get across the finish line, my department has um, ensured that staff resources are available to guide owners towards compliance. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm curious um, as to, I don't want to assume, but it seems obvious that new buildings have this requirement already built in. If you're building anything new, it has to have a sprinkler system built in, uh, in compliance with Local Law 26. Correct. So uh, any building in the city, uh, commercial building, in excess of 75 feet, 75 feet or greater, 
since 1984 has been required to have sprinklers, and that number is actually 1,022 office buildings that were constructed after 1984. So yes, that is true for that population. And, as, and again, as through our code process, we have um, uh, taken that opportunity to further refine and strengthen and include additional tools in the uh, fire prevention and suppression field. And so um, for a number of years now, uh, sprinkler systems have been required um, for buildings, typically speaking, 75 feet or higher, regardless of their occupancy class. And just for the record, 75 feet is how many, roughly, how many stories? Typically, that would be a seven-story building. Thank you. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Rafael Espinal, Council Member Heim Deutsch, Council Member Richie Torres, and Council Member Fernando Cabrera. Uh, I'd, I'd like to now, obviously, hear from my co-chair, Council Member Borelli. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner, for the buildings which, which constitutes the bulk, actually, of those who would be uh, forced to comply, uh, for those that have not yet complied with the law or sent uh, any applications for extensions or whatever, or have in any way acknowledged uh, to your agency, what is the strategy going forward uh, to increase the compliance, if you could break that down? Sure. So let me start with in compliance. So to date, there are 368 office buildings in this population that are in compliance. So that is nearly 30 percent of the entire universe. Additionally, there are some uh, 198 office buildings, so about 15 percent of the population, that are um, that have certified completion to the department, um, and we are working with that universe to ensure that they are in compliance. So that universe is on a path to compliance. So that is nearly um, uh, 45 percent of the entire universe. Now, in the uh, course of the last 15 years, we have, through our engagement and, and in response uh, from the periodic reporting, have heard from all but 94 buildings. So that's nearly 95 percent of the population that we've heard from directly. And then additionally, through the portal, we've, we've had direct engagement with 900 different buildings. So we think uh, and feel very confident that the information is out there. And again, if the goal is compliance, which it is, we've already levied DOB violations. We will be issuing further violations come December 1st. And we will continue to ratchet that up uh, because certainly enforcement is a tool to ensure people come into compliance, and that is the goal at the end of the day. So can, can you give us an idea of the, of the penalty structure, uh, roughly what, what gets, uh, what has already gotten levied? I mean, this is something for some buildings, you know, 18 years old. Um, what, what is the penalty structure, and, and what could it possibly get ratcheted up to? So uh, Department of Building Violations have been levied. Those are non-monetary uh, violations. The uh, second round of violations will be class two violations. Those are curable um, should you uh, prove that you are in compliance within 60 days of the issuance of that violation. From there, you will see additional steps, so aggravated violations being issued, um, and should we get to the point where uh, we have not heard from all uh, owners, um, certainly, class one violations would be acceptable, and that does require a reinspection on a 60 day period with additional penalties being levied. So, there are some very serious financial um, uh, and monetary penalties that uh, uh, can be uh, levied should owners choose to continue to not be in compliance but, but no on July 1st date. I mean, correct me. So, this went into effect 2002. The compliance date was uh, July 1st of this year, correct? Of this year, and the okay. law was passed, uh, as you noted, then. Um, so, n what is the max penalty an owner can face? So, on a yearly basis, we're looking uh, in excess of $50,000 in penalties. Again, if compliance is not demonstrated, our goal is to get owners there. Is, is that, I mean, just frankly asking, is, is that enough money? I mean, my, uh, I'll give you, 
you can look it up in your system. My, my grandpa put in a bathroom in their house in, in you know, 1972, and I think, I think their violation was like $5,000, and it's a small house. I mean, you, we're talking a high-rise building. I, I do believe that our approach to ensuring compliance, and since, uh, again, since July 1st, uh, when compliance was required to be in place, we've seen some 45% of the total population either in compliance or on the road to compliance. And so I certainly believe that we will be exercising all of our potential enforcement op options to get owners to come into compliance. And what, what are some of the reasons that an owner would give for not complying with the law? Are there technical reasons, or is it cost, or is it both? It can be both. It can be certainly an issue with, um, uh, you know, we're talking about a, a commercial building, and so typically you have commercial tenants who have longer-term leases, and so there can be a, a logistical issue of gaining access. So in order to sprinkler an entire building, you're not only doing base building work, you also do have to include branches through tenanted space. And so that can be problematic, um, and certainly owners may choose to wait until the space is vacant in order to do that work. But on top of that, there are also um, uh, um, certain uh, technical challenges, like potentially uh, creating a new dedicated water source, which may be a requirement. Um, there may be challenges with water pressure, so requiring additional mechanical systems in order to ensure that the pressure is what is required of the system, um, as well as just finding the space within the building to do this. So there are certainly some challenges, I would not consider them obstacles. But it sounds like you are working with owner, as long as an owner is, is making the efforts to follow the rules, you are very helpful and generous in accommodating their, their specific needs. Again, we want compliance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the name of the game for us is, is getting owners to the place of that. And so we've made, over the course of the last 15 years, staff available in order to you know, answer the simple question or do a more in-depth on how you get there. Um, so, so we've made that commitment and, and additionally we've committed to continuing the education as we've done and outreach as we've done. And, and what information does uh, DOB collect in terms of uh, hardship? What, 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 is, what, what, what form does the hardship application actually take? So the extension uh, request of which there were 112 that were submitted and I, and I should note, the committee that uh, reviewed those extension requests included not only my department, but the fire department as well as revenue. So this truly was a collaborative committee um, of owner represents, uh, representative and city uh, stakeholders to determine whether there was rationale for such. And we did approve 22, and I'm happy to give you the breakout of those 22 um, uh, buildings and what the individual um, uh, request was granted on. Um, can, can you tell me about the interim uh, reports? Were, was a failure to file an interim report also considered noncompliance? And at that point, could you uh, issue violations and did DOB? So for the year one report, we had 810 uh, submittals. The year seven report, 563. And for the year 14, 700 and 98, and final compliance, as I noted, was 368 buildings that were certified by the department to be in final compliance. So um, again, that represents all but 94 of the buildings. The department at the time did not choose to levy uh, violations, whether they be DOB violations or otherwise. Um, but uh, again, we've, we've seen that of this population, nearly 95% have been in communication through the reporting process with the department, and additionally, some at least 900 direct interactions with uh, owners separate from that reporting process. Okay. I'll turn it over now to uh, Council Member Gradenchik. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. How are you? Good morning. Always good to see a Commissioner from Queens. Um, the compliance rate here, if my math is correct, and it's usually correct, is 28%, which I think we would all agree is really, a, to be generous, a, a disappointment. Um, and I understand, and I'm following up on um, somewhat uh, Chair Borelli said, that we obviously would prefer that people follow the law as opposed to be penalized by the law. Um, 
how long does it take to, I mean, you have a big building, it's gonna take a long time, it's not gonna happen in 60 days, so what are your plans for getting people into compliance? I, I know I, I occasionally visit uh, the building where Karen uh, Kozlowitz's district office is, and they have been working in that building uh, for quite some time, so I just, typical building of 20 stories, how long would it take to get this done? It would very much depend, honestly, on, on what the conditions are of the building. But I also do just want to note that um, for owners who have yet to certify compliance, there is certainly a uh, opportunity for them to do such, and they may already be in compliance. It may be a matter of submitting to the, to the department that they are fully sprinklered. And so what we've seen um, is an increase in communication from owners as a result of our enforcement action. So since we've issued our DOB violations, we've had a steady stream of owners come in to ask or f help figure out with them whether they are in compliance and what they need to do. Now, with respect to the time frame, certainly uh, I would say it would depend on, on whether the space is tenanted or not. Um, certainly an unoccupied space um, just Much for faster. construction phasing is, is an easier space to work in. So I don't want to uh, assume to know all the conditions of, of each building um, and give you a time frame, but I can certainly expect that it would take uh, potentially some time. And what's your sense from, you mentioned that you, you've had a steady stream of responses from owners. What's your sense that most people are trying to comply with this? Have you have you heard that it's too onerous or? No, from the population we've heard from, and again, over the course of 15 years, we've heard from all but 94 buildings. Um, and that is, a, that is a strong showing. So that, to me, demonstrates the availability of, of information about this particular law um, and that it was coming into effect. And certainly, we've had conversations with industry representatives as well. The population we are speaking of in this uh, universe is a small universe, 1,308 buildings, of, and we're only dealing with commercial spaces. So I think everybody is fully aware. And again, we, we are seeking compliance. We will use our enforcement tools to help get us there. But at the end of the day, we want compliance with the law. I appreciate that. And hopefully soon we'll be dealing with residential spaces as well because uh, I've introduced a bill with Chair Carnegie to, to um, require above 40 feet to, uh, to save lives, obviously. Um, so I thank you for your testimony, and uh, I turn it back to the chairs. Thank you. So uh, before we go on to any of uh, my colleagues' questions, I do have two more questions. Um, how many employees work at FDNY's Bureau of Fire Prevention? Uh, we currently have uh, near 600 employees within the Bureau of Fire Prevention. So um, I'd like, uh, if you could, provide us with a breakdown of the roles and responsibilities of that rather large uh, employee base. And does uh, B BFP need more employees to meet, their re to meet these requirements? So you, 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 we're asking more. And is that the right amount of employees to, be, to help keep the city safe? So I'm going to try to recall our org chart by memory, but we're broken down the Bureau of Fire Prevention into, if I remember correctly, 13 units. The largest among them is what we refer to as our district office organization. And I believe we have roughly 180 uh, fire protection inspectors assigned to, uh, to the district office organization. And there are 10 uh, offices, 10 district offices within that unit that cover the city, and their role is to uh, conduct on a day-to-day -day basis uh, account-based inspections in buildings around the city of all uh, occupancy and use types. Uh, then trying to kind of work my way numbers-wise, um, if I can do it that way. So th that's the largest segment of our, our bureau. Uh, we have uh, a fire alarm inspection unit with roughly, uh, and I almost hate to hazard a guess, council member, but um, in the ballpark of 35 folks currently, including uh, inspectors and clerical personnel, and their role is to conduct uh, 
acceptance inspections of newly installed fire alarms in, in buildings. Uh, they're complemented in the fire alarm inspection process by our technology management unit, which is composed of uh, engineers and plans reviewers. Uh, they're the folks that review fire alarms when there's uh, fire alarm plans when they're initially submitted. Um, and, you know, again, I'm hazarding a guess as to a total number, uh, including uh, folks that um, were authorized uh, just this past year or in 2018, Local Law 195 authorized the uh, hiring of an additional, I believe it was 26 personnel uh, for facilitating fire alarm um, acceptance and review uh, based on the fact that um, we had just uh, transferred that responsibility from the Department, uh, Department of Buildings to the Fire Department. Uh, and we're in the process of uh, continuing to try to fill those additional positions that were, uh, were authorized relative to that law. We have a hazardous controls uh, group that um, um, regulates uh, things like hazardous substances in laboratories, uh, pipelines throughout the city, hazardous cargo transported through the city, and I'm not certain of their size. Again, I would, would, would guess in the ballpark of 30 folks. Uh, we have a, an explosives unit whose role is to um, oversee uh, uh, any blasting and explosives activities within New York City, but also they regulate uh, pyrotechnics uh, displays as well as transport of. The, they also regulate um, the use of uh, special effects and, uh, and they uh, are generally uh, engaged heavily with film and movie production in New York City and the effects related therein. Um, who else am I forgetting here? Uh, many, many folks. Uh, we, we have a licensed place of public assembly unit whose role is to do just that, uh, regulate what goes on in places of assembly in New York City. Uh, a high-rise unit specific to this conversation whose role is to uh, conduct annual inspections of what are designated high-rise buildings as well as do on-site testing to issue certificates of fitness to fire and life safety director personnel who staff, uh, who staff uh, those buildings. Um, <clears throat> certainly administrative personnel to complement uh, all the inspectors, uh, fire alarm inspectors and, um, and uh, fire protection inspectors. And we have a robust uh, certifications unit who is responsible for uh, all, the, all the permit and certification of fitness, uh, certificate of fitness testing that goes on uh, <clears throat> within the uh, fire department. Um, I think part of your question was, uh, can we use uh, more personnel? Um, we, we have an ask in. We did put a new needs request in in uh, January of uh, 19 for FY20 that did uh, ask for additional personnel to complement our fire alarm review and inspection process. Uh, and some of that ask was also to uh, upgrade our explosives unit uh, capabilities. So we, we did make those asks back in uh, January of 19. Can you tell me what, or, or, or maybe the commissioner, can you tell me what triggers an inspection? Um, can I just ask you, council member, to be more specific, what type of an inspection? So the inspections that we're talking about now, the, the, the sprinkler system inspections, are they triggered by so, 311 calls? Are they so triggered by a, a, a list and priority? Are they, how, how, how are the inspections triggered? So the department continues to be uh, a department that is complaint driven for, the, for a large volume of our work. So for all 311 complaints or complaints received uh, through any other means, we do respond to each and every single one of them. Uh, separate from that, we do, as we've discussed, have a proactive team that does construction safety compliance. But with respect to these, it is upon the issuance of a class one violation 
which the state law requires that we must reinspect on a 60-day cycle. And that is true for all class one violations that are written. So if you had to classify um, the percentages of triggered inspections, would you say 30% are triggered by 311, 30% by? I'm, no, I'm the, vast, the vast number of our, our inspections are complaint driven and I'll certainly, I don't have the number, but we'll look at a breakout. I, I mean, just saying the vast majority yeah. is enough for me. That's, that's not something you have to dig into. I, I'm, I'm just curious um, as we're, and you, you've demonstrated a, a propensity for being more proactive. Um, I'm just curious as to where we're going to ultimately wind up uh, in the long term. Well, the long term for the department, I think, is, is a more proactive department. But again, with respect to this topic, you will see a reinspection at a 60 day cycle, which is required by state law upon the issuance of a class one. Thank you. I don't, I don't have any more questions. Uh, I, just, I just have one. Um, how many high rise fires does the city see per year? Um, do you guys? Do you guys classify fires in high-rise buildings differently? And if so, how, how many per year are there? Uh, Council member, I don't have that number at hand. Um, it certainly doesn't represent the, uh, the majority of our responses. The majority of our responses, of course, are uh, in, in uh, much more conventionally sized buildings, one and two family dwellings, as well as uh, six story or below multiple family dwellings. So uh, uh, I can't say that uh, that yeah, we, we have high response numbers to high-rise buildings, although we do respond regularly to reports of fires in high-rise buildings. Would you, would you say that the likelihood of death is higher or lower in a high-rise building versus a, a one- and two-family home? Well, statistically, I think you'd see that um, um, fire deaths generally occur in the home uh, in the residence um, of, of whatever type, whether it want, be one and two family dwelling or, uh, or uh, multiple family dwelling of, of you know, higher proportions. So uh, I, I would have to track that with what our proportions are in the city, but I just know, uh, you know keeping track of national trends that um, more folks tend to die in the home than, than elsewhere. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Council Member Deutsch. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, good morning, Commissioner and Deputy Commissioners. And the Commissioner, I heard you're from Queens, but you're always welcome to move to Brooklyn. Uh, it's a great place, especially after I work with Joe Borelli to have Brooklyn secede together with Staten Island. I'll we'll make Brooklyn great again. again. <laughs> so I have, uh, I have two, two questions, two topics. One is that are high-rise buildings mandated to have uh, smoke alarms in the common areas? Yes, we'll come back to you definitively, but we believe they are. And is that all apartment buildings? Say that again? Is that all like uh, apartment buildings as well? Uh, smoke, smoke detectors and uh, uh, carbon monoxide detectors are required in apartment buildings. In, in hallways? I have to check on the common area part, but I okay. we're talking about uh, office buildings. So okay, all right, because no, I wasn't sure. I think the common areas may, you may not be like a law. But my, my question is, well, for the fire department, is it um, beneficial to have smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors in common areas? This way it alerts, because I have a bill on this, this way it alerts the tenants living there before the fire actually gets to the door. Your question is, is it beneficial to have smoke alarms in common areas. Yeah, so the reason why I'm asking is that if a smoke alarm goes off, let's say in a hallway, right, so it alerts the tenant uh, in, on that floor that there's a fire, that's why they could call 911. But then I was looking at the, other, at the other part of it is that if someone hears a smoke alarm, they may open the door to the hallway to see what's going on, and then those, those flames could come in. So I was curious if it's safer for a, a building to have smoke alarms in the, in the hallways in common areas? Well, I think a reflection on the um, NFPA standard that uh, oversees installation of smoke alarms, NFPA 72, um, if the entire building was required to be sprinklered, it would, uh, it would suggest that you, uh, excuse me, detectored, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, smoke detectored, you, you, you would detector in addition to the 
uh, sleeping and living areas within the dwelling units, uh, you would indeed uh, detect the, the public corridors. Uh, however, um, very often the reference is simply to detectoring the dwelling units, which wouldn't mandate the, um, the protection or the coverage of, of, of corridors. In terms of being beneficial, uh, yeah, the, any time you can facilitate early warning, that's not a bad thing. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I have one, I have one other question and one topic with the Commissioner. So um, you're familiar with all the people that got violations um, for the retaining walls near the subways? Yes. Yeah. So um, on that issue, like I'll give you an example. In my district, there is um, there are like three homes that are um, row, row houses, and then there's a common public, um, a common, um, I think it's a community parking sp spot, like, like parking like area. And then there's another retaining wall. So DOB came down and gave violations to those three tenants um, to fix that retaining wall because it was, um, it was coming down. Uh, DOB issued those violations not knowing that if that common wall belongs to those three homes or it belongs to the, to the next block. But they issued the violations and now those homeowners need to spend money to get a survey and to prove that either that it does not belong to them, that retaining wall. So why doesn't the DOB have like that type of access to find out exactly who that, uh, who that retaining wall belongs to before issuing a violation and making people spend thousands of dollars at times? Sure, so you raise a good point and I, and I uh, am familiar with the issue. Let me say this, the, retain, the outreach we're doing with respect to retaining walls it stems from a local law passed as a result of that catastrophic failure we saw on the Henry Hudson Parkway um, some years back. So um, uh, the rationale is there. Now with respect to this specific uh, case, I certainly would be happy to follow up with you on this specific issue. We, we obviously are issuing violations where we believe um, are appropriate and to the responsible party um, where we have that information. So if there is a way to further refine that, we certainly would be open and welcome any opportunity to do that. Obviously, we want to ensure compliance again with, um, with a uh, legislative uh, uh, requirement and want to ensure that our customers at the end of the day, residents in New York City, are hearing from us at the most appropriate time. So we certainly will look at that case uh, specifically and, and, and more broadly speaking. Okay, can, can your office like reach out to me after the hearing, if you sure. don't mind? of course. Okay, and also you mentioned we believe, like when we believe that the retaining wall belongs to a certain uh, homeowner. So is there any way to like, like it shouldn't be we believe that it should be like, yes, it definitely belongs to the homeowner and now you're getting a violation and you need to fix it. Again, we're, we're issuing violations to the uh, entity we believe is responsible. And certainly there are s certainly some instances where even within two owners there is a, a disputed ownership where you, you raise surveying as being a requirement needed. So happy to talk to you about this specific issue further. Um, and also, yes, we are looking at ways obviously always to refine our data to ensure that we have the appropriate uh, and responsible party. I got it. So one other thing, um, with today's technology and every a lot of things on public public record, is there any way to definitely know that a retaining wall belongs to who it belongs to? Is there any as any way for DOB to get that information? I, I don't believe that with absent a survey in some ca cases that that information is readily available to the department. So like. I still don't understand. I understand your part that you have to issue a violation because you want to make sure that the, that that retaining wall or anything remains safe. But before, like when a violation is issued, DOB should issue a violation. Like if someone gets a parking ticket for parking at an expired meter, mm -hmm. the traffic agency is an expired meter, and now you get a ticket. So a traffic agent is not. Uh, before they check if you have that ticket in the in the windshield, they're not going to say, "Oh, you know, I believe that." the meter's expired. And so either either that 
either that retaining wall belongs mm -hmm. to the homeowner or not, because not, now they're spending thousands of dollars, and especially if you're issuing violations to multiple people mm -hmm. who that retaining wall can belong to, and the other homes are not cooperating, right, maybe because of absentee landlord or whatever the case is, so now it falls on one person. So, and, and again, it, as in the case with, uh, uh, with Local Law 26, on retaining walls, the department issued a Department of Buildings violation, which does not come with an associated monetary uh, uh, fine. In addition, for uh, retaining wall um, uh, uh, orders that were sent out, we do ask any member of the public, if they believe that retaining wall is not on their property and within their property to reach out to the department. And we have staff available. My staff have been communicating with individual property owners, again, to ensure, A, compliance with the law, and B, if they believe this is not on their property, um, that we are working together to ensure that the department has that correct information. But, you, but they, they would have to prove it. In order to prove it, it would cost them money to prove it. And, and also the violation you said is non-monetary, right? But it, if you don't respond, then it then, then becomes monetary. So if you get 30 days, but then you have to spend the money to prove that, that it doesn't belong to you. So I just don't understand that why a person would get issued a violation, even if it's not monetary, but now they're gonna have to spend those thousands of dollars out of their own pocket to prove that it doesn't belong to them. So if it does belong to them, yes, they, get, they should get a violation and they, they need to fix it to make everything safe. But if that wall does not belong to them, then DOB, when they issue that violation, whether it's monetary or not, they need to say, no, this wall belongs to you, you're getting a violation. And again, I'm happy to look in the individual case that you've raised and certainly will look at any attempt to make my department better. Okay. Um, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We've also been joined by Council Member Carlina Rivera. I wanted to thank you so much, um, but also I, I just didn't ask Chief for you to state your name for the record, and, and you did testify. Um, if you could just state your name, just for the record. Sure, for the record, uh, Joseph Jordan, Chief of uh, the Bureau of Fire Prevention at FDNY. And Deputy Commissioner, you did offer testimony as well, if you just uh, state your name for the record. Sure, Gus Sarakis, Deputy, First Deputy Commissioner, Department of Buildings. Thank you so much for uh, coming before the Council uh, on Housing and Buildings and Fire Safety and Prevention. And emergency management. And emergency management, sorry. Um, this me this uh, hearing is adjourned.